We're taking the summer and going through uh, at least a part of the book of Esther. Boy, I've enjoyed reading and studying this book. Just a couple of reminders in the book of Esther. Uh, it is, I thank God, there's two books of the Bible uh, that, are, uh, that have the lady's name in it, Ruth and Esther. But boy, it's, it's on the backs of precious ladies that the local church is functioning. Ladies who watch the nursery, ladies who W, have you ever heard of Men's Missionary Society? <laughs> no, but the ladies have the touch. They do, and they're workers, and they're thoughtful, and generous, and gracious, and kind. And I think about the uh, church at Philippi, Lydia and her girlfriends, no doubt, were very instrumental in making that one of the more giving churches in the New Testament. Uh, Phoebe, Aquila, and Priscilla, of course, the husband-wife team there, um, Chloe, other folks in the scriptures that God mentions, Euodia, Syntyche, or two ladies in the church at Philippi. Lots of ladies are mentioned, and God exalts the, the, uh, the, uh, the position of a lady in a very special way, and I'm thankful for that. However, this, is, this book is not written, in my opinion, with a, a Christ-like uh, God perspective. It's written from a Persian perspective. It's a heathen, a, a heathen perspective, Persia. Modern-day Iran uh, is uh, Persia today, is Iran, and of course, uh, you can't get there and be a missionary there. Our dear brother, we heard this tonight, it says, Brother Michael, he, he is hated. He has got a, he's got a price on his head. If he ever came anywhere near Iran, he would give his life for the gospel, and it's very nerve-wracking probably for him to be wherever he is in the world because he is converting people from uh, Islam to the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, baptizing them, teaching them to grow very aggressively. However, I think uh, modern-day uh, Iran would have been Persia at this time. It was a very wicked, vile place. This would have been pre-Islam, but nonetheless, uh, it, is, uh, it is a country that uh, originally Babylon would be, uh, would be modern-day Iraq or that area there, but we do have uh, very wicked leaders there, Nebuchadnezzar, who probably came to know Christ, Belshazzar, and then, of course, Belshazzar, and then uh, Darius and Cyrus. And the children of Israel were kept in captivity by that, uh, by that kingdom, and then they were decreed that they could go back. M many of the people went back, but it was difficult to go back. We went back to just barrenness. We went back to a city that was broken down and without walls. The walls were all broken. That's why Nehemiah went back and, and built the walls back and, and rebuilt the gates and hung the gates there with the permission of the king. But it was still going back. They, were, they had been there 70 years. Many of them were born there. They knew the language. They knew the Chaldean language. They knew the way. They knew the philosophies. And a lot of them didn't want to go back because they were very comfortable. And, of course, uh, we oftentimes live our Christian life. We want to live very comfortably. And I think Mordecai and Esther probably should not have been here at that time. They had already given permission to go back, but they stayed. And I'm glad that God can draw a straight line with a crooked stick. I do believe that God has a perfect will for your life, and if you'll just keep saying yes to God, you will do that perfect will. However, I think that God is very gracious. When we mess up and we don't do what we're supposed to do, He is still, His mercies are new how often? Every morning. And great is His faithfulness. God is very merciful to us. And boy, if you, you say, boy, I've messed up in my life. I should have been doing this by now. I should, listen, there's no one going to steer straight and look in the rearview mirror of your life, okay? Forget looking at that. Forget those things are the past and just keep pursuing the Lord Jesus Christ today. And we'll find that God is very gracious and we find that in this story. And the book of Esther is unique in several reasons. Number one, the name of God is not mentioned one time, but you can't but not see his hand all the way through it. There's not a prayer mentioned in Esther. It has, our, it has our Bible's longest verse in the book of Esther in chapter 8 there. There's some unique things about it. I don't think probably Esther wrote the book. She may have, but it is named after her. What is most popular in the book of Esther is the statement that you've come into the kingdom for such a time as this. I think if you know anything about Esther, you're familiar with that. And that was the words that uh, Mordecai, her uncle, or her cousin, and that, uh, that uh, took care of her since she was a little girl, said to her whenever she balked about 
about uh, maybe not, not doing what she should, the courageous thing she was supposed to do to save the Jewish people. He said to her, you're coming to the kingdom for such a time as this. May I say to every one of us in this room, myself included and you included, whether you are a male or a female, whether you're young or old, you are in this world for a reason. And there's something God wants you to do. It doesn't matter your background, who your daddy is, who your mama is. It doesn't matter how things are, if you're a single uh, man or a woman or a single mom or a single dad, or maybe things aren't exactly the way you'd like them to be. God has a purpose for your life, and there is something He wants you to do. Now, it may not be very obvious at this very moment. I would say much of life is not directed. It is like, here's what you're going to do the rest of your life. I know what's going to happen to me the rest of my life. I know what I'm supposed to do right now. <laughs> And that's to stand here at this pulpit. That's about, that's about all I know. I can't keep my heart beating another minute. I, my casket may be in town today. I may have cancer in my body. I might have a heart attack. I don't know. I may, uh, there's a lot of things in my future I don't know, and you don't know your future. Uh, we can't guarantee we're going to wake up tomorrow morning. And uh, there's a lot of challenges that, that come in our future. But we can be in the will of God today. And I will tell you this, and I mentioned on Sunday a little bit, I was contemplating how that, that uh, God references a lot of time blindness in the Bible. Remember, you might, might remember in John chapter 9, whenever uh, the blind man uh, was come upon and the disciples said, who sinned, he or his mom or dad? Why is he blind? He says, no, he's blind that the glory of God might be revealed. See, we think his blindness is negative. God was thinking it is a positive thing. One thing we know about blind people, they're normally very acute in their hearing. They're very sensitive in their hearing. And you know, you and I, we need to be sensitive because the Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. We want to see everything. We want to know what's going to happen in our future and what's going to take place. And God's not as interested in what, as what you know about the future. He's not interested. In he, what he wants you to do is be very sensitive to his voice and Blind people, as a general rule, are very uh, appreciative of someone who will lead them. They're oftentimes to be led. I've seen, I've had deaf friends, and they'll put their hand on my shoulder or put their hand on my arm and walk, and I'll say, there's a step here or what have you. They appreciate that. They're very sensitive to sounds. They're very sensitive to being led. You know, God wants us to be that way. He wants us to be sensitive to his Holy Spirit speaking. God speaking. And someone said, well, he's just not calling very many people to serve the Lord. No, he's still calling. People just aren't answering the phone. <laughs> They're not listening. God has a purpose. And he needs us to be led by him and let, us to, let him follow us. And Esther and Mordecai are figuring this out. Well, and we pick up our story, and I must be brief, but just by way of, of entrance, Ahasuerus, who is one of the leaders of that domain there, and he's in Shushan, the palace, which is the, the winter palace. It's the more comfortable place to be in the southern part of Iran during the winter time, and they are there. And he has now expanded the kingdom to 137 provinces, and he invites, or 127 provinces, and he invites all of the leaders to come, and they have a big party for about a half a year. And then he has a seven-day uh, big party. A lot of alcohol uh, flows here in this party. And after seven days, the king says, you know what? And after he has been tipsy for a while and intoxicated and, and, uh, and the men are having their party and Vashti, the queen, is having her party with her girlfriends and alcohol's in both parties, no doubt, and it's just tragic. If there's one thing I can learn from the book of, Ac uh, of Esther, alcohol has no part in the life of a Christian. Stay away from it. Stay away from it. It complicates things. It doesn't, it doesn't help anything. And today our modern mantra in many people who promote it is like, it doesn't, it's not a sin to drink alcohol, it's just a sin to get drunk. Okay? You start drinking, that's what happens. <laughs> you get drunk. And there are different degrees of drunkenness. You know, how do you know when someone's drunk, when someone's not drunk? Just because someone tells you a blood alcohol level? No, you get alcohol in your system, and it'll affect different bodies in different ways, and intoxication leads to drunkenness. Drunkenness leads to all kinds of mayhem, and especially, especially sexual immorality. Here at this moment, seven days into their drunken, uh, drunken stupor, he says, get the, get the queen. Go, he tells the chamberlains, go get the queen, bring her over here so we can show her off to everybody. 
Now, I don't exactly know, and the Bible doesn't tell us, and it's not really up for discussion, but it wasn't pretty, and she said, I'm not coming. And the guys, well, that stunned them, and they sobered up enough to say, if your wife doesn't listen to you, my wife won't listen to me, and you've got to do something about this. So he removed her from being queen and gave a, uh, a writing to go out among the, the provinces that men are the boss and ladies should listen to the men. <laughs> And time goes by, he is furious, he is mad. But as time goes on, he uh, calms down from his anger, chapter 2 and verse number 1, and his leaders say, here's what you need to do. You need to round up all these beautiful girls in your kingdom and, uh, and virgin girls and bring them in and find out who is going to be a replacement. It would be four years from the time of the feast until... Esther is named to be queen uh, to replace Vashti. But they did a beauty contest somewhat. But they brought these girls in, and then uh, they gave them the things they needed, the makeup, the hair, the, hair, uh, the hair products, and everything they would need so they could be beautiful. Gave them seven girls each that would be their handmaids that would take care of them and spoil them and help them. Gave them time to prepare to meet the king. And of course, this is not God's way. I think sometimes when we get to dating, this is how people think dating should be. And I'm not necessarily uh, somebody who thinks you've got to own courtship. As you know. I don't know. God puts people together in different ways. And to say it's only one way, I don't think so. But I don't think a good way is, is in this world is like this. Just go try out anybody. And you, 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 you live immorally, and then all of a sudden you say, well, no, that doesn't work. Or we'll just do this more. That's exactly what this worldly model was. Let's just get them all out there, and you find out which one you want. And uh, Mordecai is uh, one of the one of the uh, the Jews that are left over, but he's not necessarily at this point. It's not known that he's a Jew, and it's certainly not known that a Hadassah, that's her Jewish name, Esther being her Persian name, is a Jew. And so, however much time goes on, maybe it was just better anti-Semitism just to just to be like everybody else. But I don't think everybody knows that Mordecai is a Jew, and they certainly do not find out that Esther is a Jew until after she's a queen and later in the book. So there's a lot of anonymity. There's a lot of of deceit somewhat or just kind of covering this up because uh, now he takes his his beautiful niece. Now, it looks like to me, some people say that his, her dad died before she was born and her mother died at childbirth. I don't think the Bible tells us that. That's somebody's, um, somebody's idea. But it is known, the Bible tells us that Mordecai takes care of her since she's a child and she is very submissive and obedient to him. And by the way, I think that's a great attribute that we need to remember is that whoever obeyed, those who are younger ought to submit to the older. Rebellion is something that is, uh, is like the sin of witchcraft. And young men, young ladies, if you're in a home and God's given you someone, this wasn't even her dad. And this was someone who became a surrogate parent for her, a foster parent, if you will, a family that came along. But she submitted to her, her uncle, Mordecai. And I think that's an important thing. As I look at this passage, several things come to my mind. Number one, the dangers of alcohol. Number two, I think that wrath is an issue, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but wrath brings about wrong decisions. The king got mad. We'll find that the king is, is trying to, he's going to get, uh, there's going to be a plot against him because two of his chamberlains, Big Than, I like that name, Big Than and Teresh, they get mad, and they get angry with the king, and they plot to take, take his life, and then they get hung because of their anger. And Haman gets very angry. Indignation is the word the Bible will use to describe his fury. And uh, young men, young ladies, Christians, anger, upset, doesn't do the right thing. It causes all kinds of problems. I oftentimes challenge our people in our ministry, listen, if you're angry, don't type anything. Don't send an email when you're angry. Don't send a text when you're angry. Don't respond in a phone call when you're angry. Because the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. And if there's anything God wants, he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 
Uh, God values righteousness, and when you and I are angry, we will not do the righteousness of God. I think that's exactly what, what, what we can look forward to. We see that wrath is challenged. We also see that thank God for people who care for vulnerable children. And Esther was that way. Esther needed someone to love her through some very difficult times. And our church, I, I go wherever I go, I oftentimes, and I showed you a picture on Sunday of a lady. She said, I was in Aurora from the time I was nine until I was 14. They would travel 60 miles to pick me up, take me to First Baptist Church. It was then I got saved. It was then when the trajectory of my life changed drastically because somebody loved me when it wasn't easy to be me at home. Uh, they're beautiful kids that walked across the platform here um, on, a Sunday, on Sunday evening. Uh, I, just, uh, I, I was talking to my, our daughter, and she said, Dad, I've been to two of those kids' homes. It's terrible, just what they have to be exposed to. I remember listening to Brother Abdel Judah as he tells the story of being coming home from Sunday night and walking through his living room with what he would see and what he would smell and what he would hear and going up to his attic apartment, attic apartment in, in Burbank and, and say, you know what, this is my only solace and God, you got to help me with this situation. And many people go through that, but thank God for bus workers and Sunday school teachers and people that will love them and pray for them and encourage them during, the se during difficult seasons of their life. And no doubt Mordecai is an example of that. R real, real briefly, let's look, if we can please, at verse number 8 of chapter 2. Well, let's bring up verse number 7. And he brought up Hadasha. That was her Hebrew name. That is Esther, his uncle's daughter. And she had neither father or mother. And the maid was fair and beautiful. Uh, whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So he cared for this fatherless little girl and important things that we keep at heart for the fatherless and for the widows. Verse number 8. So it came to pass that when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, when many maidens were gathered together into Shushan, the palace in the custody of Haggai, which... Um, that Esther was brought also into the king's house into the custody of Haggai, the keeper of the women. And the maiden pleased him. She impressed the guy that was in charge of her. And she obtained kindness of him and speedily gave her the things for her purification, things that make her beautiful. That would be hair products, makeup, jewelry, clothing, things of that nature. And such things that belonged to her and seven maidens which were meet to be given to her out of the king's house. And he preferred her and her maidens into the best place of the house of the women. So he actually gave her one of the better locations. Haggai was kind of impressed with Esther, and he gave her the seven maidens, gave her all the things she would need for her beautification, and gave her one of the better rooms in the king's house for her ladies. Look, if you would please, at verse number 10. And Esther had not showed her people or her kindred, for Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. So in all of this, she did not tell him that she was Hebrew. And Mordecai walked every day before the court of the woman's house to know how Esther did and what should become of her. And when every maid's turn was to come and to go into the king of Hazarus, after that she had been twelve months according to the manner of women, for so were the days of their purification accomplished, to wit, six months with oil and myrrh, and six months with sweet odors, and other things were the purifying of women, then thus came every maiden to the king, whatsoever he des she desired to be given to her to go with her out of the house of the women into the king's house." And in the evening she went, and on the morrow she returned to the second house of the women, to the custody of Shazgaz, Shazgaz, the king's chamberlain, which kept the concubines. And she came in to the king no more, except the king delighted to her that she was called by name. Just a little bit of information there. So they had all this time that they could make themselves beautiful, pass through the purification process, the beauty contest, so to speak, and now the king, though they were virgins, he was not. He was an immoral man. This is filthy, it's sad, it's difficult to even talk about. But he, he, they would come to the king. If he delighted into her, then, then he would, they, they all went from one place. They didn't go back to talk to their girlfriends about it. They went to a total different location that was kept for them and the concubines, and they were never called again unless the king decided to do that. So that's kind of what the Bible tells us. But I want you to notice here in verse number 15, 
Now, when the turn of Esther, the daughter of Abihail, the son, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go in unto the king, she required nothing but that which Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. And Esther obtained favor in the sight of all them that looked upon her. And Esther was taken unto King Hazarias into his house of the royal, the tenth month, tenth month of this process, which is, um, which is the month of Tebeth in the seventh year of the king's reign. So now we find, we find uh, seven years have gone by. He had three years before. Now four more years have gone by. And the king loved Esther above all the women. And she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. He, uh, let me look at verse number 18. And the king made a great feast unto all the princes and the servants, even to Esther's feast, and he made a release, or he got a holiday, he gave them a rest, gave them a holiday to the provinces, and gave gifts according to the state of the king. And when the virgins were gathered together the second time, the Mordecai sat in the king's gate. So sometime in there, God also gave Mordecai a promotion from being outside the gate into the gate. So we find here that God now allows Esther to be the queen. But I want you to notice something, that she required nothing more than was the minimum that whatever he gave. You know, I think this speaks to me about having... Tastes that are simple and a contented spirit. One thing we find in mature Christians, mature Christians have a contented spirit. Immature Christians will not be happy. They're, 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 they're antsy, they're irritable, they're easily frustrated, and they're difficult to be with. One of the things that were really impressed, and I'm sure there were some beautiful ladies here, but one thing that really impressed Haggai and, uh, and no doubt the king was that she required no more than was given to her. Whatever he gave to her, he, she accepted it and didn't ask for more. I can't help but think that many of the beautiful virgins of the day, with given all the things that they could enjoy, including food and purification and beauty products and seven girls to wait on them, that they kind of became with a sense of entitlement. This is what I deserve. This is what I ought to have. But it looks like to me that Esther... The Bible says she just was satisfied with whatever the simplest was. I, I think it would be important for us, and it's 821, but I want to encourage you maybe between now and the next time we talk about this to consider putting a note out beside your margin, Proverbs 23, verses 1 through 8. In that passage of Scripture, it says, When thou sittest to eat with a king or a prince, he said, um, Put a knife to thy throat if thou be a man given to appetite. And then it talks about, it talks to be careful because when you get around, and but we have, I have a good friend in this room this evening, and I thought about him as I studied this uh, recently. But he said, Pastor, when I get with wealthier men, I find there's an itch in my heart to be like that, to have those benefits of wealth. He said, I've watched some of my colleagues fall into a pit. Uh, and by the way, what does the Bible say? Does it say the Bible, that the, excuse me, that money is the root of all evil? No, what is it? It's that it's an itch that money can bring and possessions can bring, that itch for more. And even though Esther had been able to be, she had lots of things at her disposal, she was satisfied with whatever. She asked nothing more than was presented to her. And that was very attractive, not only to Haggai, but to the king of Persia. And I think it's very attractive to God. The Bible teaches us that let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. Knowing this, that you have God, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. I wonder, I wonder if you could answer this question tonight, honestly. Am I a contented person? Is contentment one of my strong attributes? Am I happy with what God's given me? Do I want what I have or do I'm always wanting what I don't have? Are you satisfied with what the Lord has brought you? Are you comfortable with his pace? Are you comfortable with his place that he's put you? Are you comfortable with the possessions that he's given you? I think it's an important thing that we can learn from Esther's testimony. 
One of the things I think that took her from being a little Hebrew slave girl to the queen of uh, Persia, I think, was her spirit, a contented spirit. The Bible tells us in the book of 1 Peter chapter 3 that in, in comparing a lady, he said, you know, if I can find a lady that will have a meek and a quiet spirit, it means she's not tore up on the inside. There's a comfortability, there's a peace inside. And by the way, lest a man should say, oh, that's what a girl has. I'm telling you what, that's what my wife needs. The first verse that comes to you and I in verse 7 is likewise. <laughs> God wants the man to have that same spirit of meekness. Matter of fact, the meekest man in all the world was a man. The meekest person in all the world was a man, Moses, willing to adjust to another's pace or agenda, a contentment. I believe that we see in this story a, another wonderful truth, and that is Desiring not more, comfortable. I have learned in whatsoever therewith to be content. 